welcome to another chapter of MasterCard Cashless Bano India. Today we will discuss financial inclusion for all where we focus on unlocking women's economic potential. Now women constitute over 48% population in India but their contribution to measured economic activity and growth is far below its potential. In most rural areas and to a large extent even in urban scenarios, women's employment is informal in jobs that are not accounted in various financial indices. It is not a surprise that most women remain outside the formal financial system despite recent progress in financial inclusion rates in general the gender gap has not narrowed much what are the challenges in making women the drivers of our economy and to get their contribution registered to discuss this we have the most amazing women who are working hard to bridge this gender gap we have with us rupa datta she's economic advisor of department of commerce we have ajayta shah she's founder and ceo frontier markets consulting and sonal shah executive director big center for social impact and innovation of georgetown university we also have with us chetna vijay sinha she is founder and president mandeshi foundation also with us is neelam chibber she is co-founder and managing trustee in this tree crafts foundation and with us is uh, shamina singh she is president mastercard center for inclusive growth welcome to this discussion ladies let's begin with you sonal uh, we've been talking about how inclusion of women is a far cry Various uh, studies say that, but the perception generally is that recently women have come into the financial, in the financial banking system. There are banks which are exclusively for women. There are loans which are designed for women. Then why do we say that that women are still not in the financial system? So I think uh, women are in the financial system, largely not counted in the financial system. So I think moving to cashless allows us to think about, are we actually identifying them? In a cash society, rarely do we see women because they're usually paid under the table and barely in the inform mostly in the informal economy, very rarely in the formal economy. So what we're asking now is saying, let's count them, let's count the contributions that they're actually giving. Um, but also, we haven't been paying attention to women. We have all these products that we create for women, but they're like less than 1% of the actual financial marketplace that exists for women. So yes, we can talk about the seven funds that might be for women, and that's $60 million. $10 trillion economy, what difference does that make? <laughs> so really thinking about what does it mean when women sit equally at the table, when they actually have jobs that they are getting counted for, when they are getting paid for the work that they are doing, that is every product should be made for women. We shouldn't make women's products. We should make products that all women can have access to. All right. Uh, what about you, Jit? Now you've worked with women who are uh, in, in the rural sector and they are working with the, uh, they're trying to make a difference. You know, there are social innovations they're doing. They, they are, uh, we even see weavers, we see uh, laborers. But do you feel that there are enough uh, programs happening in terms of, as far as, because I'm going to come back to uh, ma'am also. Is government giving you that kind of support? Women are getting that kind of support to get included? So the first thing I would like to say that in India, microfinance industry is around $20 billion industry. These women in microfinance have actually proved themselves as a best repayer. And when they repay these loans, these women are rural women, they, doing their, they are street vendors, they are fruit vendors, they are farmers, and they have repaid the loans, they have proved themselves. Now actually it's a time for the financial mainstream sector to see them, to account them. And it's not only just like, you know, it, they are waiting for access. No. In fact, women know how to get access. It's a, it's a question of control. How do you provide them control? And control on finance, control on digital finance, control on wealth. And how do you do that? And there, I think the mainstream banking sector is, uh, has to take a responsibility. Government has to come forward. And then Women are ready for those opportunities. You're saying microfinance is uh, acknowledging women, but do they get the loans easily? Because uh, the general perception is that women are not a good consumer to lend to. So if you see the IFC report or the World Bank report, which clearly says that there is a gap, and gap is where women actually want to become, they have repaid the loans, they have graduated, they want to become an entrepreneur and where they require a bigger loans. And if you see the reports, it says that 
every 100 loans which comes from women to the mainstream sector beyond 90s are rejected. What are the reasons for that? One, of course, collateral. But another is that our, our product are easy for them. So the whole question is about ease of doing business, ease of doing banking. And if that we don't provide, these women, they are so busy in their economic activity, they don't have time. Mm. They will find out their ways. So I, that I hope so that they can find out their ways. Uh, Shamina, what did the studies uh, show you? Uh, do they really say that, that women uh, are able to get that kind of financial inclusion that they expect? And is it becoming a better scenario? Are we seeing any change happening? So um, I, thanks for having us today. And I think that if I had to sum it up, I would say for India and for the world, the future is female and the future is digital. And the sooner we can connect the two and make sure that women are counted, as Sonal said, they're getting the credit that they have earned and deserve, the faster we'll see growth from the economic perspective. The studies do say that financial inclusion, especially in India, is making a difference. With the recent government uh, reforms and the demonetization, you're seeing a movement towards digital. The question is going to be, in order to unlock the economic potential of this country, it's going to be really important to make sure that women are included in the, in the birth of this new digital economy. And so they are moving into uh, the financial system, but the question is, are they using it? Are they able to thrive in that kind of financial system? And I think that's really where the gap is, and the gap is going to continue unless we really start to bridge it. So Neelam, uh, you worked in an industry where uh, men are maybe the biggest bread earners and they are the dominant ones, and of course, mo as in most of India. But uh, do you feel the contribution of women actually gets registered? Because we do know economically in all the indices, it is not getting registered. But do are the families also acknowledging it? Yeah. No, we have a very queer situation in India. 93% of India's workforce is in the informal sector. And within this 93%, I think we are all very clear that 50% of that is women, right? And there's huge female participation in farming, huge in the artisanal sector. If you look at our weavers, our potters, you will always see husband and wife working shoulder to shoulder on every activity. If you go to a weaver's family, it's really sad that the woman's participation is not even accounted for. He is always uh, uh, calculates his wages, bases his full day of weaving. Whereas the women, the mothers, the wives, the daughters are spooling, they are winding, they're doing a whole series of side work. So therefore, I think uh, it's not really easy to include them just by opening a bank account. It's great that bank accounts are being opened, but it's very important to do something further in the ecosystem. Yeah? And that's where we find that there are a lot of players in the sector, especially MasterCard, Standard Chartered, a whole host of people who are coming forward and saying, what beyond just financial inclusion? What beyond just opening bank accounts and creating micro-insurance or micro-savings? There's a huge fractured ecosystem out here, which we need to work on. When uh, Chetna talks about uh, mainstream banking, women not uh, more than, I mean, uh, more than 90% of loans getting rejected. If you're looking at the kind of loans women at village level can apply for, it could be to buy a goat, to buy a cow, to, to do, but we've also got to look at more evolved ecosystems. So that's where we are finding a lot of support, uh, where we can build a larger ecosystem, a stronger value chain, where women become part of a cooperative, they can take on larger, more complex orders, and the entire value chain works in a cashless manner. Okay. The customer at one end can pay cashless, it will move down to the account of the woman and she will just have it in her account. And the, uh, the last thing I'd like to say here is that in this entire cashlessness in financial inclusion, we sometimes miss very simple things. Even in a city like Bangalore, we did an analysis of the women in our cooperative and they were always giving their ATM cards to their husbands or their brothers to operate. They all had s accounts. Yeah? But they were hesitant on how to enter an ATM and you know use it. So just increasing the number on the data saying, okay, she's included. She's it's in, not it's enough. Not enough. You have to actually see it in So practice. in our financial inclusion training, using an ATM 
is like one of the key trainings we provide. Yes. Yeah. So Ajayta, because you work with women who you are calling social uh, in entrepreneurs and innovators. So are these women, uh, when you met them, were they the ones who were part of a banking system or these were completely uh, isolated women and then you saw them changing or you saw that these were women who were part of the banking system but as she's saying, they didn't know what to do with it. Um, sure. I mean, I, I think I'll first start with just saying that um, at Frontier Markets, I mean, we have 1,000 women entrepreneurs um, in Rajasthan, and they've been the economic drivers uh, for 400,000 rural households in Rajasthan. Now, what does that mean, right? Um, these are women that were technically a part of some banking system, because again, you know, the government has started account holders. A, yes, they have uh, the self-help group initiative that was started. Um, did give these women access to um, some sort of bank account uh, through the Jandan Yojana scheme. And they were technically accessing some sort of capital. However, big however, they weren't necessarily using this infrastructure they had access to. They were still using cash and there were still cash transactions and those, the cash that they were earning or keeping was under their bed. So ultimately, if we're understanding this entire process, Women have access to capital, maybe, maybe not. Women have access to bank accounts, maybe, maybe not. But I think to Neelam's point, are you including them in a very different, unique, co-creative way? Our women today are telling us that they want internet connectivity, they want a mobile phone, they want access to their ATM card with a PIN number so they can actually put the money in their bank account because if they can transparently see that they have earned over 60,000 rupees in a year, and they're making the decisions on their financial transactions for their children, they can actually show physically to their village, to their husbands, that they actually are the breadwinners in the center of that value chain. So that gives them a position in the society. Absolutely. It's a position of power. It's a position of control. It's a position of confidence. And most importantly, it's then us really being able to show very easily that investing in women is smart business, <coughs> right? I mean, our women today with the 420,000 households that they've worked with, They've helped him generate 59 crores of savings and kerosene. But that's not being tracked through any sort of financial system. It's not being tracked through any sort of digital solutions. So how do we kind of get them into that space where we're not having someone else do it for them? They are taking the empowerment in their own hands. They have the tools, they have the training, they have the access, because they definitely have the confidence and the passion and the know-how. Okay. So we need to combine it. We have seen a lot of push from the current government in trying to include women. A lot of push. Uh, but what are the key uh, schemes that you would say that have actually helped the women on the <coughs> ground level? We have these, uh, you know, National Rural Livelihood Mission, which is a huge uh, uh, program run by uh, Ministry of Rural Development, working on the microfinance and the self-help groups. About 55,000 crores have been disbursed there. Now there's that, that is a demand-driven strategy. And a uh, lot of women are taking advantage. We have these uh, Mahila Hearts, which is again an initiative of the Ministry of Women and Child Development, where there are some 4 lakh NGOs, artisans, and women exhibiting their uh, products on these. So these are, plus we have the Prime Minister's Mudra Yojana and Stand Up Yojana and several other programs. Besides this, even in all our ministries, we have now ensured to that, you know, like a lot of, even for commerce, we have beneficiary-oriented schemes. Other social sector ministries would have large number of beneficiary-oriented schemes. To ensure that this money actually reaches the beneficiary, which in most cases would be women, we have a lot of focus on the direct benefit transfer, the DBT, yes. linking it with the Aadha. And, uh, and this is part of a public financial management system. PFMS is being implemented very strongly. It is regularly monitored. And the whole idea is that there should be no parking of funds. Funds should be available as and when required and can be disbursed as per need. So these are, uh, so government, you know, uh, these initiatives, while they are very, uh, you know, obviously worth appreciation, are very good initiatives. What they, uh, I feel that this needs to be leveraged with the government efforts if yes. it really has yes. to have an impact. So, Sonal, how do you do that? How do you take something which is at a block level, at a district level, and uh, make it big? actually so that it has an impact because as we were talking about it earlier also just a few numbers in India's context is not enough. 
Yeah. You know, um, so I, uh, when I was, at, I used to run the Office of Social Innovation at the White House and President Obama, and it was the single greatest challenge we had also is aggregating information at very local levels and making sure that equally across the economy, everybody gets access to it. And I think that's what the Aadhaar program actually has the potential to do, is if you can capture all of that information and everybody is on uh, digitized, uh, is digitized, then all of a sudden you now have block level information at the national level. And you can d make decisions at the national level at the block level. So that, that program has huge potential and I think what the government's trying to do has huge potential. But it also requires the way government thinks differently. So rather than running programs, the government's job is to see what's happening across the economy, be the convener as, uh, as, as um, uh, Rupa has said, and also think about how do you use that convening power, that information, and to allow all of that to happen on its own? You don't need to overregulate it. You just need to make sure that the rules of the game are fair. We need to understand this in terms of risk, reward, and in yeah. censures, which ultimately for me means that our rural women that we're working with or the people that are on that village level that are given the tools to take the responsibility to collect the data, they need to be incentivized, right? We need to start thinking about this in a market-based approach. If you're moving markets to make better decisions, then it's about economic vigor, right? And um, that is where, you know, we, for example, when we work with our women entrepreneurs or even our rural retailers, we incentivize them every time they give so us a you're piece of data. About commercial incentives. Commercially, we're giving them money for every mm -hmm. time that they actually give us a data point. Because that data point is going to be used for many different things. And, you know, it's being used for us to work with banks to create financial products. It's being used with us to work with corporate product companies that want to enter the last mile. So if we are going to create um, you know, a movement around this quickly, we do need to start thinking about this on a market-based approach so to start thinking about a commercial commercial movement. It has yes. to have economic yes. power as well. Yes. In fact, I would like to add what Ma'am said that, you know, in India we have jam, right? Janadhan, Aadhaar, and Mudra. Now, if we take this jam to the doorstep of women, what do you think? I mean, these women actually are waiting for such opportunity. Two things are very important. One is Android phone. And second is that provide a doorstep facility of cash, like loan or savings. If you have these two, because women actually want, it's not an excess, women wants to control. And if it is available to rural women in India at their doorstep, that ease comes in. And that whole data, when they do transaction, digital transaction, that data is their wealth. It will help them because they have that data which is in their control and they can prove that, you know, I have this much of business, I do these many transactions and I can, I'm perfect for the loan, I'm perfect for the business. But I have this one question that, you know, you can uh, take all that technology to the person, but will the person take it? To the point, uh, institutions like MasterCard, Standard Chartered, a whole lot of banks, a lot of their CSR funding is going towards financial literacy trainings. Mm -hmm. All of us are standing on the back of very, very rigorous trainings. Okay. We have to, and the women are very keen to be trained. Mobiles now should be not only exposure, but it should also be a tool for empowerment and digital training, uh, designing products which uh, which will help in improving the financial literacy of women, and you know uh, make them more techno savvy. That this is one I think in rural areas, this is probably one mindset people who are working in field would have to encounter. And that is where all these interventions would help. Government, of course, can give you the data. Data analytics is becoming an important part of our functioning also. And we all, the, there would be the mapping of the interventions, the mapping of the beneficiaries uh, in the villages. But the, to match the two and to you know, make the microfinance programs also more effective by uh, linking them to the marketplace. To build on uh, Ma'am's point, the. Uh, one of our fellows at the Center for Inclusive Growth um, is uh, Rama Bijapurkar, and she says that uh, mobile phones are the central nervous system of India, not mm -hmm. uh, roads, not trains, not buses. Um, and so, and I think that that's one of the reasons why it's uh, this, this, this time and this place is for women, because once they can leapfrog the, the um, shortcomings of infrastructure by using the mobile phone, they can leapfrog into the economy. Because let's face it, the world is going towards e-commerce. More yes. and more people yep. are shopping online yep. um, <clears throat> using their phones. 
And so to the extent that women are part of that movement, not only as consumers, yes. but as entrepreneurs, as Absolutely. owners of the business, that's going to be the place where we can move this. So we will continue this conversation. Uh, right now we have to take a break, but I love this line that uh, we've just heard, and that is that mobile phones are the central nervous system of India. We do have the technology, and it is uh, reaching the doorsteps, but we have to ensure that women actually use it to empower themselves. It's time for a short break now.